Stripping down science. The Naked Scientists. Hello, it's Sunday, January the 23rd. Welcome to The Naked Scientist with me, Chris Smith. And with me, Diana O'Carroll. And this week, we're finding out what is antimatter and how does it differ from normal matter. And we'll be also talking to someone who's managed to make anti-hydrogen, as well as finding out how antimatter holds the key to better body scans. I'll also be investigating how gravity bends a beam of light. Plus, the answer to why the journey home from somewhere seems to go quicker than the outward leg. You must have noticed that. Well, researchers have shed some new light on how the brain registers time. And also, how a mouse with a human immune system is helping scientists to develop a new treatment for HIV. If you'd like to get in touch to ask a question, you can tweet at Naked Scientists, write on our Facebook page. To get there, you go to nakedscientist.com forward slash Facebook or drop us an email. It's chris at the naked scientists.com. The Naked Scientists podcast is powered by UK Fast, the UK's best hosting provider. On the web at ukfast.co.uk. This is The Naked Scientist, and this week with me, Chris Smith, and with Diana O'Carroll. And first up, as we always do, let's kick off with a look at some of this week's top science news stories. Diana, what have you got for us this week? Well, a new study this week has found that in order to keep track of time, our minds exploit as many clues in the environment as they can get hold of. And this means that our internal clock isn't solely controlled by pre-programmed cells in the brain. So researchers from University College London have shown that some of our perception of time is governed by observing how much the world changes. The researchers also think that through life we have learned that things in the environment change at an average rate. So if we compare the changes we see to the changes we expect, our minds can estimate how much time has passed. Publishing in Current Biology, the researchers used two experiments to test their theory. For the first, 20 participants observed blobs of projected light appear twice. They were then asked which appearance lasted the longest. The light blobs were then projected alongside a mottled pattern, which was programmed to change randomly, but at a regular average rate. And this addition actually improved the participants' time judgments, which suggests that their brains used the rate at which the patterns changed in order to construct an in internal time reference. And for the second experiment, the authors varied the rates at which the patterns changed and then asked the subjects to judge how long the mottled patterns lasted. And when the patterns changed faster, the test subjects thought they had lasted for longer, which demonstrates that a change in sensory input can alter our sense of time. Now, Dr Manish Sahani, who led the research, uh, believes that, the, that because of the various types of sensory input and analysis that go into this timekeeping, there may be no single area in the brain which is responsible for it, which is news. And that would explain also why when you drive somewhere it seems to take a lot longer to go than it does to come back because you're paying lots of attention to the changing visual scenery along the way, remembering where you've been, trying to remember the way home, for example. But then when you turn around and go back, you get home apparently quicker because you're paying much less attention to the scenery passing. Yeah, I suppose if you think about it, your brain is trying to filter out less sort of sensory information per mile that you're travelling. So yeah, it would, it would make it travel much more slowly. Thanks, Diana. Well, also this week, uh, scientists have used a mouse which has been given a human immune system to develop a new treatment or a potential new treatment for HIV, which is the virus responsible for causing AIDS, and in the course of doing that, damaging the immune system, of course. Now, currently, the way which we treat HIV is to use a drug strategy called HART, H-A-A-R-T, which stands for Highly Active Antiretroviral Therapy. And this involves giving patients a combination of different drugs which tackle different bits of the virus life cycle, and this minimises the risk of someone getting a virus which is resistant to the agents. But it's not without problems, and although it has enormously improved the prognosis for people who are infected with HIV, those drugs carry a very high risk of side effects, which can be very unpleasant. And at the same time, people do eventually progress to forms of the virus which are resistant to all of those agents, so they can still develop immune problems. So in recent years, scientists have begun to look for ways of using our understanding of RNA, the genetic material of the virus, as one way to tackle the problem. And there's something called RNA interference, which actually got the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. And this is where you add to a cell a piece of RNA, nucleic acid, which is effectively the genetic mirror image of a gene in a virus or in a cell 
that the virus is relying on. So you, you target a cellular gene that the virus needs to grow, for example. And when you put this mirror image bit of RNA into the cell, it finds the normal counterpart, the two lock together and cancel each other out effectively. And it turns those genes off. And this is one way that researchers think we might be able to deactivate HIV. But one major problem with doing this is it's really hard to get these interfering RNAs, as they're known, into the target cells. So another approach that researchers have been looking at is to also use one other interesting aspect of RNA, this nucleic acid, which is that it folds up into all kinds of interesting shapes in a predictable way. So if you choose certain sequences of RNA by putting different genetic letters into it, you can make these bits of nucleic acid that fold into all these interesting shapes that can do things. And Charles Neff and his colleagues have got a paper in the journal Science Translational Medicine this week they're a team at Colorado State University. And what they've done is to design one of these RNAs, and they're called aptamers, in such a way that they will bind to something called GP120, which is on the surface of the AIDS virus. It's the sticky bit that it uses to penetrate target cells. And the clever thing here is that they have combined their aptamer, their sticky HIV-targeting RNA, onto a second piece of RNA, which is one of these RNA interference molecules. And what they find is if they use a mouse, which has been engineered so that it has a human immune system, you can infect this mouse with HIV. The mouse gets exactly the same sort of syndrome that the human would, but you can test this particular approach on the mouse. And what they find is that mice treated with this aptamer coupled with the interfering RNA, develop almost undetectable levels of virus in their bloodstream almost immediately. And as long as you keep treating them with the agent, then they remain well, and their blood cells don't change their levels at all over the entire course of the study, and compared with control animals, where if you don't treat them, then they have up to a 50% decline in vulnerable immune cells just in 18 weeks. So this suggests this could be a very powerful way to treat HIV in a novel way, which no one's exploited yet, and uh, which may, if we can translate this to humans, offer a new way to treat the disease without many of the side effects that the current drug regimens carry. Okay, so that's mice, but how far away is this from being applied to humans? Well, the point they make at the end of their paper is they say that, uh, yes, there is a difference between mice and men, and we need to know what the pharmacokinetics are. So when you put these agents into a person, where will they go? How effective are they? But those are simple studies which, when we've got some grasp of that, will mean that clinical trials are not going to be too far away. Excellent stuff. Right, well, also in the news this week, um, researchers at uh, Imperial College in London have discovered an unusual process uh, which is happening in a contagious form of cancer that infects dogs. And canine transmissible venereal tumour, or CTVT as it's known, is spread by mating and it can also be transmitted by licking, biting or sniffing tumour-affected areas. And the tumour cells then move from one animal to another and they establish a new tumour. But what this new study has revealed is that the cancerous cells keep themselves healthy by stealing key cellular spare parts from the host animal. And if the same is true of human cancers, it could hold the key to a host of new treatments for the disease. And to tell us a bit more, we're joined by Dr Claire Rebeck, formerly from Imperial College. She's now out at Cold Spring Harbour in the USA, and she's with us. Hello, Claire. Hi. Welcome to The Naked Scientist. First of all, can you tell us a bit more about the biology of this tumour, this canine transmissible venereal tumour? So this tumour is actually very interesting. Um, It's one of only two types of tumour currently known that can be passed on from one individual to another and actually grows like um, a skin graft. With the dogs, it's able to go to any breed of dog and can also actually be passed on to some of the wolf population as well. Somehow it evades the immune system, uh, so the dog is not able to recognise that it's not part of itself and therefore it doesn't reject the tumour until it grows. And what was the specific question that you were looking to solve with the present study, Claire? So for this present study, we were trying to actually find more information about um, how the tumours were related to each other and trying to estimate um, some more uh, information on the age of the tumour. We had actually done a previous study which um, tried to calculate how old the common ancestor of all the tumours that we collected were. So we actually collected tumours from seven countries in this particular study. Um, We found that on the previous study, we found that all the tumours from these these countries all came from a single origin, and that this was approximately only about five or six hundred years ago. We were trying to use the the mitochondrial genome for this present study, which is another, another region in the cell which provides genetic information 
to provide more information about how old the tumour is. So you've got lots of samples of these tumours from various places and you've got DNA out of them and specifically DNA from these mitochondria, the little organelles in cells that give cells their energy but which carry their own DNA so they're useful as a, as a marker. So how did you then uh, study the mitochondria DNA? What were you looking for? So we were looking for uh, mutations in the DNA. Over time, mutations arise and you can actually measure these and you provide information on how closely related one tumour is to another and also how long it's been since these tumours have been separated based on the number of mutations that have arisen between the tumours. And if you compare the numbers of mutations in the, just the DNA of the tumour, the normal cellular DNA, and the rate at which mutations are cropping up in this mitochondrial DNA, you'd expect them to be the same, were they? Well, actually, they, they're not always the same. Certain regions in the, in the nuclear genome, which is the area of the genome which most people are familiar with, um, there are regions which will mutate much more rapidly. Um, there's also regions which code for genes, and these tend to mutate at a much slower rate. So we have actually looked at the rapidly mutating regions and found a result from these about the common ancestor and, and provided an estimate of the age for this. The mitochondrial region, or the mitochondrial DNA, also has regions which mutate quickly and slowly. So we actually used both of these regions to help us with the answer that we were looking for. But in both of these regions, the results that we found, we didn't expect them. Why not? What was wrong? We expected there to be not so many mutations in either region, either the fast or the slowly evolving region. But we found actually there was much more variation between the tumours than we expected. And how do you account for that? What do you think is going on? We think, therefore, that the mitochondrial genome is actually not part of the, the tumour per se. And so I mean it hasn't come from a single origin. So we suspected then that the tumour has somehow able to take up the mitochondrial DNA from a different source which we suspect would be one of the host dogs that it had grown on at some point in the past. Do you think it's taking up uh, just the DNA of mitochondria from adjacent host cells, or do you think it's scooping up entire mitochondria and bringing them into the tumour cells to keep them healthy? So that's a good question, and we're not entirely sure about that. We suspect that it's actually taking up the whole mitochondria, um, so the whole organelle. We think this because the original type of cell that this tumour came from acts as some sort of immune cell, so it's able to engulf foreign matter. So this type of cell, we suspect, may then have the ability to engulf the, the mitochondria itself. If this is true, if it is taking up mitochondria on block like this and incorporating them into itself, does this mean the same could happen in any human tumour, and this could be one of the reasons why cancers grow so successfully, despite being genetically highly disorganised in humans and other animals? So I think probably not because this, the need for it to take up the new mitochondria is mainly a result of the fact that the tumour is so ancient. Um, in a normal person, their cancer is only as old as the person itself, so the number of mutations may not be sufficient in order for it to require a new, a new input. Um, however, I mean, this may happen sometimes, but it would be very difficult to detect. Thank you very much. Claire Rebeck, uh, she's based at Cold Spring Harbour, and you can read that paper if you want to. She published it this week in the journal Science. Diana. Well, also this week, researchers have shown that, for fact-based subjects at least, practising a retrieval exercise produces better test results than concept mapping. Now, based at the Purdue University, Jeffrey Karpika and Janelle Blunt run several tests on 120 college students in the US. In their experiment, they had students create a concept map from a set text and then tested the students on what they had learned. Now, a concept map, for, for those that don't know, is a sort of spider diagram with lots of lines linking up ideas and facts and the concept map was actually developed in the 70s by Joseph Novak and quite a few institutions now encourage its use. The researchers uh, then had the students complete a sort of reading comprehension or retrieval exercise on the test on the text and then tested them on what they'd learned. So the students were essentially being tested on the test and then tested again. Um, what they found was that the students performed better on the retrieval exercise than they did on the mind mapping exercise and what's more they retained the knowledge for 
longer if they're learned using retrieval. So publishing in Science, the researchers claim that it's both the act of recall and the act of reconstructing knowledge that are key for learning. But if you're still a huge fanatic of concept mapping, you could, of course, combine the two by creating a mind map from memory. So if you want to do well in exams, just make sure you test yourself. It's funny because when you started saying all that, I thought, yeah, that's actually the way I've learned from my exams throughout my life um, by writing something down and then trying to recite it and recall it and, and, and error checking myself that way. If I couldn't recall it and, and I'd got the facts right, then I would do it again till I did. Yeah, it's, it's funny, actually. I always used to find that if I tested somebody else on the subject I was learning, I actually learned it much faster that way as well. Well, they say the best way to, to learn something is to have to teach it. Well, just to finish us off this week, scientists have discovered what they say is the world's smallest farmer. Now, we're all comfortable with humans farming. We're comfortable even with animals like ants, some beetles, some birds farm things. For instance, leafcutter ants farm edible forms of fungi. But now researchers have identified a farmer which is just one cell big. This is actually a kind of amoebae that lives in the soil. They're called Dictyostelium, and they are under scrutiny by a lady called Deborah Brock, who is at Rice University. She's got a paper in the journal Nature this week describing this. And what she found when looking at these things, they're very interesting. They live in the soil, these amoebae. They eat bacteria, but if they run short of food and get hungry, they all flock together and they form a, a multicellular thing resembling a slug, which goes towards the surface and when it gets close to the surface it puts up these fruiting bodies which uh, contain fertile amoebae on the top which can be disseminated to the wider environment in order to try to go off and find pastures new and some of the amoebae in helping to make this slug sacrifice themselves so the rest can survive. But when Deborah Brock studied these things a bit more closely, she saw that about a third of them, so 36% of them, had things inside them. And a closer look revealed that they're bacteria. And to cut a long story short, by doing some careful studies, she found that what's happening is that as these amoebae are munching bacteria in the soil, they forego some of their meal to store the bacteria inside themselves as a sort of seed so that when they go to a new place they can then plant those bacteria and grow a new colony of bacteria to then eat later. And at the moment the researchers don't know why only a third of them do it. It would appear to be some kind of genetic trait but they're very interested in finding out what the genetic underpinnings of this are because there are lots of diseases including things like TB which involve microbes having the ability to get inside other cells and persist in them. TB, salmonella or other examples like that. So if we can understand the genetic basis of what the microbes are doing inside these particular amoebae, perhaps we'll have a new lead in understanding a bit about how TB and other major pathogens cause disease in humans. If you want to follow up on any of the stories that Diana and I have talked about this week, they're all present on our website with the references. You can follow them up there at nakedscientists.com forward slash news. Laying the facts bare. The Naked Scientists. For more information, look us up online at nakedscientists.com. This is The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and with Diana O'Carroll. Get your questions in by email to chris at thenakedscientists.com, tweet at Naked Scientists, or join us on our Facebook page and you can find that at www.thenakedscientists.com forward slash Facebook. Now, coral reefs are regarded as the rainforest of the sea. They play a vital role in marine ecosystems. And now, a new reef research unit at the University of Essex in Colchester has been set up to study them. And Planet Earth presenter Sue Nelson has been to meet the assistant director, Dave Suggett, and the director, Dave Smith. We have a central large tank which acts as a whole ecosystem with corals, fish, numerous different types of organisms that make up a coral reef. And then around the outsides of the central system, we have a designated site which we use to fragment corals to grow through experiments. And on the other side of the central system, smaller tanks where we can very precisely control the environmental conditions from light levels to temperature and in some cases water quality as well. We're in the doorway at the moment. Let's just go inside where it's even noisier and take a closer look at this large, central, rather beautiful tank. Can you give me an idea of the range of species that you've got? Sure, yeah, it is quite noisy in here, but that sort of mimics quite nicely what a coral reef is. It's a noisy, high-energy environment, and that's quite important for us 
to be able to mimic the sort of environments that we see in nature. We have about 20 to 22 different species of coral, ranging from very highly branched corals to more boulder-like corals and encrusting corals. We have soft corals, which are uh, very uh, part of the same family of the reef-building corals, but don't produce the skeleton. And of course, dotted in inside and within the little holes and cubby holes of the coral itself, we have numerous different species of fish, all of which play important functional roles on the reef, mopping up seaweed and algae and keeping the reef in check and a balance. Is this coral all from one particular region? This coral we see at the moment, about the 20 species, are all from the Indo-Pacific region around Indonesia, the Philippines, which is actually the centre of coral biodiversity. So you find more species there than anywhere else in the world, and most of our research in the field is based out in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, so we're mimicking a typical Indo-Pacific reef here. Dave Suggett, you're especially interested in looking at the effects of ocean acidification on coral. How do you go about doing that? Well, ocean acidification is is an exceedingly complex process. We're only just beginning to understand the carbon chemistry associated with that. As a term or a process, it effectively describes excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere entering into the oceans. And normally, oceans have a natural capacity to mop up that CO2, but With so much CO2 now coming from the atmosphere, it's exceeding this, what we call the buffering capacity of the oceans. And so gradually we're seeing a decline in pH, making it less alkaline rather than more acidic, for want of a better term. Why this is so important is that corals require inorganic carbon for several reasons. First of all, for photosynthesis. And secondly, they need carbonate ions to be able to form their hard shells, which makes them so important for constructing coral reefs. And how do you go about monitoring then how much carbon carbon dioxide a piece of coral is taking in? Well, this has been what I think really the sort of keystone element of our research was to try and take existing technology that's used in terrestrial systems where you can easily monitor carbon dioxide in the air and actually start to use that to monitor carbon dioxide in seawater. So in order to do that, we've uh, taken technology from the medical industry where you have gas permeable tubes and it lets the gases permeate through them and then be measured by the terrestrial system. So this is a major step forward for us, and and for the first time being able to measure carbon dioxide in seawater continuously and rapidly alongside various other measures of the carbon chemistry. So we have a, a holistic view of ocean acidification that's actually been very rare until now to do. Dave Smith, obviously you're not going to know exactly what's going to happen until you finish your experiment, but you must have a crucial idea in terms of what the differing effects of carbon dioxide are going to have on coral. Absolutely. Coral reefs are so biodiverse and so productive because they're very physically complex. So any environmental conditions which decrease coral's ability to produce the complexity will have major consequences for the number of species a coral reef has and the half a billion people who depend on coral reefs for food. Dave Smith, no relation, and Dave Suggett. You have to be called Dave to study corals at Colchester, by the look of it. They're at the Coral Reef Research Unit, which is at the University of Essex, and they were talking to Planet Earth podcast presenter Sue Nelson. You can download the latest Planet Earth podcast and find links to its host website, which is Planet Earth Online, by following the links on thenakedscientist.com forward slash planet earth now anti-matter is usually thought of as being rather mysterious but in fact it is much more abundant than you might think and it may well be the key to explaining some of the mysteries that surround the big bang we're joined by professor andy parker from the high energy physics group at cambridge university hello nice to be here (laughs) right very basic question to start off with then what is antimatter well antimatter is an interesting thing um It really takes a little bit of history to understand uh, clearly where it comes from. So back in the 30s, a a theorist, a British theorist called Paul Dirac, was trying to put together the the latest physics of his day, which was quantum mechanics and relativity. And at the time, quantum mechanics only really described things that were moving relatively slowly, that is, relatively slowly to the speed of light. Whereas relativity told us that physics was different, close to the speed of light, and there were lots of new effects. So obviously people wanted to put these two together. And Dirac managed to combine the two concepts into one equation, now known as the Dirac equation. And it's a beautiful example of the power of mathematics because he wasn't expecting to find anything other than small changes to the behaviour of electrons when they got very fast. But what his equations told him was that for every electron, which is a negatively charged particle, 
there was an exactly the same sort of state, but with a positive charge. It had the same mass, it would behave exactly the same way, but it was kind of the opposite. And furthermore, the equation said that you could take pure energy and turn it into an electron and a positron. So the antimatter partner of the electron is the positron. Um, and he was quite baffled by this, actually, when he first saw it. It's interesting that he kind of didn't believe his own maths, and he tried for a while to pretend that this positively charged particle had to be the proton, which was the only positively charged one he knew of. Uh, but it had the wrong mass. And eventually they accepted that this was actually a serious prediction of something called antimatter, and that if you ran the equations for a proton, you would get an antiproton, and if you did it for a neutron, you would get an antineutron. So every type of particle should have its opposite with the opposite electrical charge, and if you bring the two together they will disappear in a puff of energy. So antimatter basically came about as a result of mathematics. It was the only way to solve the equations. That's right. It was the only consistent solution to quantum mechanics and relativity. OK, and how does it relate to the Big Bang then? Well, OK, so let me just say that this is not a theoretical concept anymore. People have found antimatter. They found the first anti-electrons in the 30s and the antiproton in the 50s. And we routinely make it and it's used in hospitals. But, um, OK, how does it relate to the Big Bang? Well, the Big Bang was a state that started off with very high energy. And that energy would have allowed the formation of lots of matter-antimatter pairs of particles. So you would expect, naively, that the, the universe would be made of equal amounts of matter and antimatter because it was formed from a state of pure energy. Um, but this is not what we observe. If we look at this studio, for example... I've got a microphone, I haven't got an anti-microphone, and there's nothing in the room which is blowing up around us. So clearly there isn't very much antimatter here. So you might think, well, OK, it's separated out. There's a region of the universe somewhere with all the antimatter in, and there's a region here with all the matter in. But if that was the case, there would be a boundary between the two. And you would see along that boundary, you would see the matter and the antimatter annihilating. So you can look for that because it would produce a very strong source of radiation at a very particular wavelength given by the energy of the annihilation. And we don't see that anywhere in the universe. Um, we've had satellites up looking for antimatter particles coming from long away and whizzing by. And the results are, so far, uh, have not really observed any unexpected amount of antimatter other than what's being created from energy near us at the moment. Um, so it looks as if the universe is only made of matter. So then you ask the question, why? Well, I, I was actually going to ask the question, um, so we know it should exist, but how can we actually go about detecting it? Ah, OK, that's quite straightforward. Um, we have lots of different particle detectors that can uh, measure particles and tell what type they are. So uh, if you had one that was looking for electrons, you would ch test the charge that is negative by applying a magnetic field, and a positron would go the other way. So what is the why, and why isn't it there? OK, so what appears to have happened is that although matter and antimatter are very symmetric, that is, they, they look like a mirror image of each other, there is some very small difference in the physics between the matter and the antimatter. That is, their interactions with the rest of the world are very slightly different. And that means that when the universe started annihilating all the matter with all the antimatter, it didn't quite balance, strangely, even though it had been created in equal amounts, it didn't quite balance. The rate is slightly stronger for antimatter. We know that most of the annihilation took place because we actually see a universe full of light, which are the photons that came from this annihilation. But there's a tiny, tiny dose of matter left over, and that's what we're all made of. All the stars, all the galaxies, all the radio studios are made of this tiny little piece that didn't manage to get annihilated. That's really quite profound. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so you mentioned that, that light and radiation is emitted after annihilation. So can we harness that? Can we use that? Well, we could if we could make a lot of antimatter, but we're not very good at making it. It's, in principle, straightforward. You take uh, something with a lot of energy, say a, a proton beam, and you slam it into something like a lead target, and some of that energy will make antimatter. So you'll get pairs of electrons and positrons of protons and antiprotons made. And at CERN, the um, Collider Centre in Geneva, we do this routinely. And I used to work on an experiment, actually, where we collected antiprotons in order to annihilate them with protons and see what happened. But you don't make very much. It would take thousands of millions of years to make a bottle of antimatter. So although we can make enough to do experiments, we can't make enough to make large quantities that you could use as an energy source. 
Seems like a shame, really, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> it? It costs you a lot more energy to make them than you would ever get back. <laughs> yeah, OK. Well, um, I'll, I'll draw it to a close there then. Thank you, Andy. That was Professor Andy Parker from the High Energy Physics Group at Cambridge University. He'll be sticking around to answer some of your questions towards the end of the show. In November 2010, researchers at CERN announced that they had managed to make and trap the antimatter equivalent of hydrogen, so-called anti-hydrogen. Geoffrey Hankst is one of the scientists behind that breakthrough. He joins us now from Geneva. Hello, Geoffrey. Hello. So, first of all, tell us, why were you wanting to trap anti-hydrogen? What was the reason for doing the experiments? Well, our long-term goal is to study if there really is a difference between the physics for matter and antimatter. And we'd like to do that by comparing hydrogen and antihydrogen. Hydrogen is something we understand very, very well. It's kind of the model system for quantum mechanics. It's how we learned how to do the physics with atoms. So we now know how to make anti-hydrogen atoms, and we've just recently learned how to trap them. So we'd like to shine some light on them, if you will, to see if hydrogen and anti-hydrogen behave in the same way. The laws of physics as we understand them now say that those two things should behave identically. So it's one of those things, you, you start with something very simple and work out how the simplest thing works before trying to get clever and look at more complicated things. It's, it's also the only thing in, in terms of atoms that you can imagine making out of antimatter. Indeed. Well, perhaps you could tell us then how you actually went about making antihydrogen. Okay, first you, you need the components, which are antiprotons, the, the nucleus, and positrons, which are anti-electrons, as has just been explained by Professor Parker. We are at CERN because CERN has a machine that makes antiprotons. It's called the antiproton decelerator. And I, I think Andy came in about how you do that. You, you run protons into a target and you collect antiprotons, which are some of the particles that come out of that interaction. So CERN has this wonderful facility. It's unique in the world where they can collect some antiprotons for us. And in addition, they can slow them down. These antiprotons are made at high energy. And we'd like to have our antihydrogen atoms essentially at rest. We'd like to have antimatter in a bottle, if you will. So this machine does the first step. It takes the antiprotons and slows them down to an energy where we can manage them. What we then do is slow them even further and trap them in a kind of electromagnetic bottle in a almost sort of the best laboratory vacuum you can make. Matter and antimatter don't like each other, so you need to deal with your antimatter in vacuum. So we have a device that slows and stops antiprotons. The same device can also slow down and stop positrons from a radioactive source, and then we combine the two. So negative antiproton meets positive positron, they can combine and form an atom, and that atom is antihydrogen. Now, we've been doing that particular thing since 2002. What's new is that we've managed now to hold on to the antihydrogen atom. I was just That's going to ask the, you about that, because the first steps that you explained beautifully, if I may add, are relatively easy because those particles have got charges on them, which means you can guide them with magnetic fields and things like that because they will experience forces in magnetic fields, won't they? But once you actually combine them and you make your anti-hydrogen, they're now neutral. So how do you then confine and constrain and control them then? Yes, relatively easy is exactly the right world because the first step took about 15 years, right? The making of <laughs> anti-hydrogen. But what you do now is, although the, the anti-hydrogen is neutral, it has a, a small magnetic character. You can think of an atom as a, a minute compass needle. So it can be deflected by very strong magnetic fields. So we can use that interaction to hold on to the antihydrogen atom, even though it's neutral. The, the rub is that that interaction is so weak that when we take the, the best magnets we can fabricate today, the deepest bowl, if you will, sort of imagine this is you're holding your antihydrogen in a magnetic bowl. The depth of that bowl will only hold an antihydrogen atom that is 0.5 degrees Kelvin above absolute zero. All right, so it has to be extremely cold 
Otherwise, it just runs away. Because otherwise, it's moving too quickly, and trying to hold otherwise on to it when it's going that yeah. fast is very hard. It, again, imagine a marble rolling in a bowl. If the marble is going too fast, it goes over the lip. So our bowl is very shallow, so these antihydrogen atoms need to be moving very slowly. And in temperature equivalent, slowly means half a degree above absolute zero. Pretty chilly. And once you yes. get it down to that sort of level, how long can you constrain and confine the anti-hydrogen so that you can study well, it? In the, in the article we published, it's a bit misleading because we were just trying to show that this was possible. So we produced our anti-hydrogen in the, in the bottle and then released it as quickly as we could to see if it was still there. And in that experiment, it was about two-tenths of a second. We can now hold on to it much, much longer, a thousand seconds. Oh, is- that's a very long time. Yes, that's a very long time. So long enough, in other words, to begin to ask some important scientific questions about the characteristics of the stuff you're making and and constraining. Exactly. That's the next step, which we hope to start on in May when the accelerator starts up again. So So let's, in, in the last couple of minutes, let's talk then about what you can learn from this. Because one of the interesting things that we see when we look out into space, we can use physics that Bunsen of Bunsen Burner fame taught us, which is that we can work out what things are made of by looking at the way they interact with light. They absorb or emit light at characteristic wavelengths, and that's how we know what distant stars are made of, for example. Does an antimatter material like anti hydrogen, does that have the same absorption spectrum that normal hydrogen does? Well, that's exactly the question that we'd like to answer. This standard model of physics says that it must, but there are no measurements yet on anti-hydrogen. So we would like to start that as quickly as we possibly can. We're going to shine both light and or microwaves on anti-hydrogen atoms to see if they absorb and emit exactly the same colors or frequencies, if you will, of uh, electromagnetic radiation. So that's exactly the question we would like to answer and to see if there's some asymmetry between those two systems. The difference between high energy physics and this type of physics is we can make precision measurements. The anti-hydrogen or the hydrogen atom is so well known to one part in 10 to the 15, that's a lot of zeros, that we can make a precision comparison. Rather than going to very high energy and looking for something new, we look for very small differences in a system that's extremely well understood in the matter sector. Jeffrey, we'll have to leave it there, but thank you very much. Jeffrey's staying with us. He's going to answer any questions you have for him at the end of the programme. That was Jeffrey Hagst. He's the spokesperson for the Alpha experiment at CERN, trapping anti-hydrogen. Diana. You're listening to The Naked Scientists with Chris Smith and Diana O'Carroll. Still to come, the answer to how gravity can bend a beam of light. But first, Dave and Mira have been discovering how antimatter helps doctors to produce better body scans. For this week's Naked Engineering, Dave and I have come along to the Addenbrooke's biomedical campus to investigate antimatter, but more specifically, just how antimatter can be used for medical imaging. So here to tell us a bit more about this is Dr Richard Ann Sorge from the Cavendish Laboratory at the University of Cambridge. Now Richard, if you could just set the scene then as to what are the different types of medical imaging? The oldest type of medical imaging is just straightforward x-rays, although these days um, that is usually done as a CT scan, which actually gives you a three-dimensional x-ray image by combining many slices. In the 1980s, I guess it was, magnetic resonance imaging started to be developed based on the magnetic properties of the hydrogen atoms in all the water molecules and other organic molecules inside every living person. So because you're looking at the hydrogen atoms rather than X-ray, which is just looking at the very heavy atoms in your bones, you can see a lot more detail of the sort of squishy bits. Yes, that's exactly right. One of the major applications of MRI imaging is, for example, to look at people's brains. But now, as well as CT and MRI scans, another technique is PET scanning, which is your particular area. Yes, um, PET stands for positron emission tomography. The positron, of course, is the antimatter equivalent to the electron and is like an electron except for the fact it has a positive charge. It's possible to manufacture radioactive isotopes that will emit positrons. For example, fluorine 18, which has a two-hour half-life, is used um, a great deal in PET. For example, in a molecule called FDG, which is a glucose analogue, when injected into a patient, 
will be metabolized and the radioactive fluorine tends to accumulate in positions in the body where the tracer has been metabolized. The end result of that is that one literally has hot spots of radioactivity in places where there are hot spots of metabolic activity. So, if, for example, your brain or especially, I guess, a tumour will be being very, very active and res- respiring a lot, so we'll be taking a lot of glucose, so that will be, show, be very radioactive. Yes, and so for the last 20 years or so, PET has been used mainly for oncology. Metabolic function is the end result, but how does a PET scanner actually work to find where those metabolic areas are? What happens is that the um, radioactive substance decays to produce a positron which wanders around in your tissue, travelling typically a millimetre or less, and then meets a normal electron in another atom and annihilates with it. The electron and the positron disappear, and two gamma rays, each having an energy equivalent of the rest mass of an electron or positron, are produced, travelling in fairly precisely opposite directions. So this is sort of the equals mc squared thing, where all of the mass of the electrons has been converted into energy in those photons. And these are what are essentially picked up by detectors in the scanner. Yes, uh, an important feature is that two gamma rays are produced and are detected simultaneously. That means that uh, since you have injected a radioactive substance, there are a lot of background counts, but the coincidence uh, of the arrival of two gammas tells you that you've actually got a good event associated with a decay somewhere on a line joining the two detectors that went off. And then I guess you look at many, many events and you know all of these appeared on lots of different lines and somehow you've got to work out what, where the original radioactivity was? You can run quite complicated mathematical algorithms on uh, these lines of response to reconstruct the most probable distribution of the tracer. It's a three-dimensional image for each small volume region in the body showing the number of decays that were detected from that region. Typically, these images are displayed in false colour, so you get different shades of colour representing the intensity of the emission. But what about positioning it, say, within our actual bodies? Tissue which is not absorbing the tracer is invisible in a PET scan, so it can be problematic locating where a suspected cancer is actually located. Is it in a lung or is it somewhere nearby? And so I guess to get around that problem, a recent development has been the combination of PET scanners with CT scanners to then get the structure and the metabolism. Yes, that's right. This has all the same disadvantages of a normal CAT scan, and it's very good at finding the bones, but not so good at the soft tissues. And, well, this is where your research really comes in, Richard. So we're currently in an imaging suite, standing next to a large PET scanner, but this is a combined PET MRI scanner, which is what you're developing. MRI gives different types of contrast as compared to CT. So, for example, in the brain, you can get a much more accurate view of where the PET activity is taking place, There are a number of technical challenges involved in combining PET and MRI. The photomultipliers used in PET scanners don't work in magnetic fields, which are essential for MRI scanners. Well, how with your design have you tried to overcome these problems? Because looking at the scanner now, it's a a large white cylinder, about three metres long, and there are wings attached to the centre of it. If you look carefully at our system you'll see that whereas a conventional MRI scanner is a single cylinder, we have sliced our scanner in the middle and opened up a gap. The gap means that we can put a conventional PET detector in the centre of the magnet and the light that's produced can be brought out of the magnetic field using fibre optic guides travelling transverse to the axis of the magnet and uh, end in a region where the magnetic field is sufficiently low that the photomultipliers will operate satisfactorily. And so the wings which Mira mentioned earlier are basically the ends of these light guides and all the electronics? Yes, that's right. So the end result of that is that our system is, uh, has a sensitivity of about 5%, which actually compares fairly favourably with uh, unmodified systems, which would be 6 or 7%. A further advantage is that Unlike combined PET-CT systems, 
where the CT is run once as a quick snapshot at the beginning, the MRI can be run continuously for the 10 minutes or so that the PET scan goes on, and one can track, for example, breathing and allow for that to make much higher quality images than is possible with a PET CT system. That was Dr Richard Ansorge from the Cavendish Laboratory at the University of Cambridge talking with Dave Ansell and Mira Thillingham. Keeping you abreast of the world's best science. The Naked Scientists. You're listening to The Naked Scientists. It's Chris Smith and Diana O'Carroll, and uh, we're answering all your science questions to do with the science of antimatter. And this is an interesting one. On Twitter, Ladislas Reventlov, testing my ability to pronounce lots of letters put together, I think, asks how much energy is released when a positron and an electron collide. And he says, I mean in practical terms. Andy, that's probably one for you. OK, well, in scientific terms, it's about 10 to the minus 13 joules, which means you'd need to do it about a 1,000 million million times to warm up your cup of tea. It's quite a lot, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we've also got one here, I, I guess, Jeffrey. This is probably one which will be your cup of tea. Uh, Joseph Mazigo says, can antimatter combine with other matter chemicals just in the same way matter does? So if you took hydrogen and reacted it with oxygen to make H2O water, for instance? Theoretically, yes. The, the problem there is ever making any antimatter atom other than antihydrogen. That's just not in the cards. That's so improbable that we don't even talk about doing that. Why couldn't you do that? It's just uh, you need a lot of energy to, to create your antimatter in the first place. The antiproton is the lightest nuclear antimatter particle. To go to even antihelium takes much more energy and is much more unlikely so that's just not in the cards for the way that we do things today. And also for you, Jeffrey, I've got a question here from Jeremy Cox. And uh, he says, would an electron and positron orbit each other? Is that possible? Absolutely. They make a, a system called positronium, which is a, a sort of a, a mini atom made of one positron and one electron. And that has been studied extensively. Also, the spectrum of positronium has been studied. The problem with that thing is it doesn't live very long. Uh, about 140 nanoseconds in its long-lived form. So it's difficult to study. Antihydrogen is stable. That's why we want to go with that. It's also a pure antimatter system. Positronium is half matter, half antimatter. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, Luciano Medrano has got in touch on Facebook. Andy, he's asking you, uh, in PET scans, you get these positrons, as we heard, uh, from radioactive decays. How do you make sure that they annihilate the electrons in your body and not in the stuff that's around your body and therefore create false signals? OK, well, they're created at very low energy um, because they come out of a nuclear source with, uh, with, with not a lot of energy intrinsically, and so they stop rather quickly in the body and they annihilate very close to the site where they're made. Um, there's a lot of matter in their way and they're not moving fast enough to get through it. And Andy, I've got another question. Actually, maybe you and Jeffrey can tackle this one. I'll start off with you, Andy. Um, do matter and antimatter attract each other? OK, so if you just take a positron and an electron, they attract each other because they've got opposite electrical charges. Um, but a much more interesting question is if you make a, a matter atom and an antimatter atom, do they then attract each other? Do they have Because if they were two atoms, they would have a positive pull together from gravity. So an interesting question, which I think Jeffrey might like to comment on, is whether there's some anti-gravitational force related to antimatter. It's a very fascinating question and an experimental one that another group here at CERN hopes to answer. The short answer is that nobody knows because physics is fundamentally an experimental science, but people are planning on doing that experiment. Maybe in, in five to ten years we'll have an answer. Most people don't think that there's anti-gravity, in other words, that antimatter and, and matter repel each other, but there may be some slight correction to the attraction. That's what the current thinking, it, it's as far as it goes at any rate. Thanks, Jeffrey. We've got this one here from Frank, I, I presume this is pronounced Vals. It's probably something related to what you were saying, Andy, because you were saying about we've had satellites up in space to look for antimatter. He's actually asking how do we detect antimatter in space? What are you actually looking for? Well, it depends which sort of uh, antimatter particle you're looking for. But basically, you have lots of detectors which can tell the mass of particles. And if you put them into a magnetic field, they bend one way or the other, depending on their electric charge. So if we see something with a proton mass and a negative charge, then we identify it as an antiproton. 
and similarly for anti-electrons, which are the dominant things that you would expect to see coming at you. OK, just to keep you on your toes, Andy, um, we've got another, another question from uh, Monazuki, and uh, he asks, I presume it's a he, uh, does an anti-universe exist? Ah, well, if I knew that, they'd give me the Nobel Prize. Um, so... It seems unlikely. I mean, there's nothing in principle to stop you having a Big Bang that created an anti-universe rather than a universe uh, made of matter. But what we do see is that there is no obvious place where there's a lot of antimatter annihilating a lot of matter. So if you wanted to make an anti-universe, you would have to separate it completely from the matter one, or at the point of contact, there would be lots of emission of gamma rays as everything annihilates. And we see no such source. So the idea that there's a chunk of the universe which is all antimatter uh, seems to be ruled out experimentally, at least as far as we've looked so far. Now, whether there's a, an anti-universe hiding down some strange extraspatial dimension is a completely different question. Um, I'm actually looking for extraspatial dimensions at the moment, but I don't think anyone is seriously expecting to find an anti-universe at the end of them. And in 20 seconds, can you do for Shane, why do matter and antimatter actually annihilate each other? Well, they have opposite quantum characteristics is the technical answer. Um, so once you put them together, you get a kind of null state which has nothing left except its energy. He did pretty well. He did that in about 10 <laughs> seconds. Diana. Perfect for radio. Um, but it's now time for question of the week. And this week, is light a bit too light? Hi, I'm Ayush Panwar. And my question is, how can light be deflected? Because according to Newtonian gravity... Gravity is a property of mass. Then how can light, which is considered massless, be deflected due to gravity? Light has no mass, apparently. So what little trick is gravity using to make a beam of light bend? I'm Andrew Ponson. I'm a researcher at the Kavli Institute for Cosmology at the University of Cambridge. And I also appear every month on the Naked Astronomy podcast. So actually... Regardless of the mass of the object, the acceleration caused by gravitational pull is the same for any object. Now, Newton came along and gave a mathematical explanation of this. And the, the maths essentially is that mass appears on both sides of the equation which governs this behaviour. So it actually cancels out. But... If the mass is actually zero, then it's no longer really mathematically valid to, to do that cancellation. Nonetheless, it's certainly true experimentally and mathematically that as you go to smaller and smaller and smaller masses, these things are still deflected in the same way by gravity. But since there's this sort of mathematical paradox of trying to divide by zero, that isn't conclusive. And to get the full mathematical answer actually requires coupling a description of what we call electromagnetic waves, that's the uh, kind of physics underlying the way that light travels, to Einstein's theory of gravity, which is general relativity. And only then do we get rid of this paradox of dividing by zero and end up with a conclusive answer that shows that just as objects of any mass are affected by gravity, so light, which has no mass, is also affected by gravity. So what is it that relativity tells us about gravity that can help us solve the problem? So in the end, Einstein's description of gravity, which is general relativity, tells us that the effect of gravity is caused by distortions in space and time itself. Now, if you do something as fundamental as distorting space and time and, and reshaping it, then anything that lives inside space and time will be affected. And that includes waves. And so waves can be bent and can follow different paths if you change the geometric properties of the space they live in. Gravity can effectively bend space and time, meaning that anything in its field is also distorted, and that includes light. Lovely answer from Imat Fall on the forum, who went into a little more detail, explaining how light follows a geodesic. Under gravity, this is the shortest distance it can travel from one point to another within curved space. And now for something else, also subject to the whim of space-time fluctuations, germs. This is Emilio Romero. I'm calling from Guayaquil, Ecuador. First of all, congratulations on a great show. Now my question. The other day, after watching a TV commercial, my daughter asked me, how do we know that certain disinfectants kill 99.9% .9 of the germs? And what would happen if we use it twice? 
Would that kill 100%? Thank you. Can a double washing clean your hands of all bacteria and viruses, or should we just carry boxes of latex gloves everywhere we go? Answer to us via email with chris at thenakedscientists.com, or why not write or draw your thoughts on our forum? And you can find that at thenakedscientists.com forward slash forum. Thank you very much, Diana. Diana O'Carroll with our question of the week. And thanks for doing a great job on the show this week, Diana. That's all we have time for. Next week, we're delving into the world of leprosy. We'll find out all about the history of the disease and what the marks it leaves behind on ancient bones can reveal to modern day archaeologists. We'll also find out what the current situation is with the disease around the world and how big a problem it still is. So if you have any questions about that or you'd like to suggest something you'd like us to talk about here on The Naked Scientist, do please send in your thoughts and feedback. You can email chris at thenakedscientist.com or you can send us a tweet to at Naked Scientists. Thank you to our wonderful production team, Ben Vowsler, Tom Simpkins, Mira Senthalingam, Louise Ogden, Dave Ansell and Diana O'Carroll. And until next time, goodbye. The Naked Scientists comes to you from Cambridge University and is supported by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC, the Natural Environment Research Council and UK FAST. For more information, look us up online at thenakedscientists.com.